Good evening, Vice Chancellor, um, judges, colleagues, students, um, friends, visitors. We seem to have everybody here tonight. I'm Sarah Worthington, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the law faculty for the 2019 Cambridge Freshfields Annual Lecture. This is the fifth lecture in this series. It's been generously sponsored by Freshfields, and it's always held in the law faculty, and it's organised by the Cambridge Private Law Centre. One of the centre's ambitions right from its start has been to facilitate a more informed and lively debate about some of the fundamental and significant legal issues that we face. Now, I know that those issues are always debated in a lively fashion in any active law school. And indeed, some of these issues are of such significance that the general public becomes enthusiastically engaged uh, in weighing in on the challenges and the difficulties that they generate. Views differ, discussions, even arguments ensue. But the difference between these debates over the dinner table and within a seminar room is that we don't have to decide. We don't have to come up with the best answer uh, and one that will settle the issues in, in a manner that will work for the whole of our society, making the community we are part of better for all of us. But when these issues arrive at the door of the Supreme Court, that's exactly what they have to do. Now, I think sometimes the problems seem to affect only the world of multinational corporations and the elite corner management offices. But very often they don't. Very often they're much more in our familiar home territory, uh, quite personal issues, or they're the sorts of issues that really affect our fundamental rights of engagement with each other. And on those issues, when asked, <coughs> all those issues when asked, the Supreme Court has to give an answer. It can't dodge the issue and change the subject into something a bit more uh, relaxed and easier, asking you to please pass me another cup of tea or pass the salad. They have to decide. And so it's a real special treat to welcome Lady Hale here as President of the Supreme Court to deliver tonight's lecture, which she's engagingly called Principle and Pragmatism in Developing Private Law. Uh, it's perhaps a nice touch to this fifth lecture that, you know, it's a, fifth is a nice anniversary, isn't it? That the inaugural lecture in this series was um, given by the President of the Supreme Court uh, when it was Lady Hale's predecessor, Lord Newberger. So the evening before International Women's Day, it's nice to see that change. Baroness Hale needs no introduction, but in these sorts of lectures, one always gives one. And I think the numbers here are a testament to the fact that probably there's nothing I can say that you don't already know. Um, I looked at Google, you know, the Bible for all serious researchers, uh, and it seems to have thousands and thousands of pages of content. Um, but I thought I'd pick up some of the firsts in her glittering career, just mostly to inspire the students, I suppose. Uh, Lady Hale was born and educated in Yorkshire, so you know, northern toughness. Um, she was, so she was, I was born in Yorkshire, so you know, I've got a bit of uh, a passion for that sort of thing. She was the second of three sisters, and it seems to me that thereafter she was not going to be second again. Uh, she studied law here in Cambridge at Girton, and it's really nice to see here tonight uh, all the law fellows uh, and the vice mistress of Girton in support. Um, she graduated with a starred first and top of her class. She was called to the bar in Gray's Inn uh, and topped the bar finals in that year and later on became <coughs> treasurer uh, of her inn. She spent 18 years in academia, another first for a Supreme Court judge, becoming a professor of law in Manchester. She was the first woman and the youngest person to be appointed to the Law Commission, overseeing a number of important reforms in family law during nine years with the Commission. She was the first and only woman to be appointed to the House of Lords as a Lord of Appeal in Ordinary, the first woman as a Supreme Court Judge, the first woman to be the Vice President of the Supreme Court, the first woman to be the President of the Supreme Court, and since last year she's also been the first woman alongside um, Beverly McLaughlin from Canada to serve as a non-permanent judge 
uh, in the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong. And then I think, just to lighten the tone a bit, she's probably also the first woman Supreme Court judge, in fact, perhaps the first Supreme Court judge at all, to appear in a double spread in Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> but enough. Um, tonight, as I said earlier, Lady Hale has chosen as her topic principle and pragmatism in developing private law. Uh, she's going to speak, and then we're going to have an opportunity for <coughs> questions and answers. Uh, and as her title suggests, I think we're in for a treat, and no doubt a few surprises. So without more ado, Lady Hale, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah, for the invitation and for the introduction. I think I should tell you that there are at least three important occasions when I have been second. <laughs> I was the second woman member of the set of chambers that I joined in Manchester. I was the second woman on the Court of Appeal of England and Wales, and I was the second woman treasurer of Gray's Inn. Now, one has to say thank you, of course, to all those first women. <laughs> Because without the first woman not having frightened the horses too much, you never get to be the second. And that was why I was so worried that it took so long for the second woman to join me on the House of Lords Supreme Court. I wondered what on earth I was doing wrong. There we go. So talking of the Supreme Court, when designing the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, we deliberately put the library at the centre of the building. Surrounded by the three courtrooms, one on top, one to one side, one to the other. It contains, of course, centuries of legislation and law reports. It symbolises an important truth. We are not making it up as we go along. We are building on those centuries of legal learning, even if most of us now look them up online rather than from physical books. At the same time, we probably all agree uh, with Mr. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' observation. Quote, The law, so far as it depends on learning, is indeed, as it has been called, the government of the living by the dead. There is a peculiar logical pleasure in making manifest the continuity between what we are doing and what has been done before. But the present has a right to govern itself as far as it can. And it ought always to be remembered that historic continuity with the past is not a duty, it is only a necessity. On the other hand, Holmes also said this, it is revolting to have no better reason for a rule of law than that so it was laid down in the time of Henry IV. <laughs> it is still more revolting if the grounds upon which it was laid down have vanished long since and the rule simply persists from blind imitation of the past. So the law has to move with the times, up to a point. I have speculated in other talks about the ways in which the court may develop the law to meet changing social and economic needs. Today I want to speculate about what should guide such developments, principle or pragmatism, or to put it another way, in fact the way that Sarah suggested to me when we first talked about what I might talk about, doctrine or policy. I think we're the same. <laughs> We are, of course, the Supreme Court of the whole United Kingdom. Most Scots lawyers would probably still agree with the great Professor T.B. Smith that the unwritten law of Scotland was derived from different sources from the English and gave more weight to principle than to pragmatism. Smith attributed the development of English common law to the fact that the English monarchs established early on their control over the administration of justice. Judges built up the law precedent by precedent. Quote, this was essentially a professional law based on the inns of court, which were close corporations of lawyers. At quite an early stage, these lawyers adopted a semi-insular and self-sufficient outlook, and in particular set their faces against the competition of ecclesiastical courts, against the Roman law, against the authority of academic treatises, and against a system of professional legal education based on the universities. <laughs> Can't see that. <laughs> English private law, in his view, it was the loser 
from this insularity and case-by-case -case approach, which led to multiple categorizations rather than general principles. Scots lawyers, on the other hand, were the opposite of insular. They looked to France and continental European influences, studying Roman law and continental treatises in continental universities. This led eventually to Stair's Institutions of the Law of Scotland, quote, gathering the various threads of Roman, canon, feudal, and other customary law, which had already been recognized by the courts, and drawing upon the learning of Europe's leading civilian commentators, Stair restated the law of Scotland in an original, selective, comprehensive, and rational manner, end quote. Now, these differences of approach are no longer so closely associated with nationality. There are those of us in England who try to start from a basis of legal principle, and those of us who start from a basis of pragmatism, starting from the beginning or starting from the end, what Stephen Sedley called reasoning from a given conclusion, which is what, of course, all advocates have to do, but in my view, no judges should. Um, but from whichever end we start, we are all guided to some extent by our view of which solution will work best, which will be the most practical, both in this case and in others like it. But how do we know what will work best? Back to Holmes and his famous dictum, the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. But whose experience? And Lord Reed in his famous lecture on the judge as lawmaker, where he exploded the fairy tale that judges do not on occasions make law, expressed the view that where it was right for them to develop the law, they should, quote, have regard to common sense, legal principle and public policy in that order. But who's common sense? And what public policy? I have been known rudely to say that uh, one man's common sense is another woman's hopeless idiocy. <laughs> That is, of course, putting it far too strongly, uh, but the point is, everybody thinks their experience is the right experience. Everybody thinks that what they think is common sense is common sense. Everybody thinks that what they think accords with the public interest, accords with the public interest. And I can illustrate this dilemma by recent examples from all three main areas of private law, contract, tort, and Dare I include it, family law? That's private law. Now, tort is the most obvious illustration. Uh, my first husband used to say that it was void for vagueness. <laughs> and I think any law student trying to study the law of negligence will sympathise with him for that. Uh, the law of negligence is littered with concepts redolent of pragmatism, proximity, fair, just and reasonable, even causation and remoteness. Proximity, for example, sounds like a principle, suggesting a sufficiently close relationship between two people to found a duty that one should take reasonable care to avoid causing harm to the other. But debate rages over whether it's any such thing. Is it not rather an ad hoc device, judicially micro-refined by the particular facts of cases and particular idiosyncrasies of the judges hearing them? Fair, just and reasonable is even worse. It doesn't even sound like a principle. And until recently, there was a tendency to think that it governed the whole of the law of negligence and not just novel situations. As Lord Reed explained in Robinson and the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire, the proposition that the fair, just and reasonable test applies to all claims is a mistaken reading of that case. It is normally only in a novel type of case where established principles do not provide an answer that the courts need to go beyond those principles in order to decide whether a duty of care should be recognised. Quote, where the existence or non-existence of a duty of care has been established, a consideration of justice and reasonableness forms part of the basis on which the law has arrived at the relevant principles. It is therefore unnecessary and inappropriate to reconsider whether the existence of the duty is fair, just and reasonable, subject to the possibility that this court may be invited to depart from an established line of authority. Nor a fortiori. Can justice and reasonableness constitute a basis for discarding established principles and deciding each case according to what the judge may regard as its broader merits? <coughs> Such an approach would be a recipe for inconsistency and uncertainty. And he quotes from Lord Justice Hobhouse in the case of Perrett and 
Collins, but I won't go on because he says just exactly the same thing. Well, that's all very well. But what are we to make of the wrongful birth cases following McFarlane and Tayside Health Board? In the inner house, Lord Cullen said this. In considering the defender's argument that the birth and hence the cost of rearing the child could not be regarded as a loss in view of the incalculably great benefit which a child represents, it's important, in my view, to endeavour to draw a clear line between the application of principle and the imposition of a policy decision as to what the court should entertain as a loss. Quote, end quote. He swiftly decided that, as a matter of principle, the costs of bringing up the child were a recoverable loss. He then went on to consider whether there were public policy arguments against allowing it, citing Lord Scarman in McLaughlin and O'Brien. Quote, the distinguishing feature of the common law is this judicial development and formation of principle. Policy considerations will have to be weighed, but the objective of the judges is the formulation of principle. And if principle inexorably requires a decision which entails a degree of policy risk, the court's function is to adjudicate according to principle, leaving policy curtailment to the judgment of parliament. Here lies the true, true role of the two lawmaking institutions in our constitution. By concentrating on principle, the judges can keep the common law alive, flexible and consistent, and can keep the legal system clear of policy problems which neither they nor the forensic process which it is their duty to operate are equipped to resolve. If principle leads to results which are thought to be socially unacceptable, Parliament can legislate to draw a line or map out a new path. That's the end of the quotation from Rod Scarman. Lord Cullen went on to point out that there were policy arguments on both sides and summarised them. On the one hand is the argument that the rejection of the claim will vindicate the value of human life and the blessings which a child can bring to his or her parents. It avoids the risk of an undue temptation to seek abortion and the risk that a child in later life might discover that he or she was unwanted. On the other hand, there is the argument that these risks are overstated, that a child is not always a blessing. <laughs> that the ability of couples to choose to limit the size of their family in accordance with lawful and widely available means of contraception should not be ignored, and that damages may help to alleviate hardship as well as meeting need. End of quotation. Uh, his conclusion was that it was not for the court to assess the relative strength of these arguments. He was not persuaded that there were any overriding considerations of public policy against awarding the pursuers their damages. The House of Lords, of course, as everyone knows, reached a different conclusion. Lord Steyne, for example, was quite clear that policy outweighed principle. He said it's possible to view the case simply from the perspective of corrective justice. It requires somebody who has harmed another without justification to indemnify the other. On this approach, the parents claimed the cost of bringing up Catherine must succeed. But one may also approach the case from the vantage point of distributive justice. It requires a focus on the just distribution of burdens and losses among members of society, end quote. He was firmly of the view that commuters on the underground, that's his substitute for the man on the Clapham omnibus, <laughs> which of course is incredibly London-centric <laughs> and probably in those days also sexist, um, would say that the parents should not recover the costs of bringing up the child they never meant to have. I have no idea how he knew that my guess is that the male commuters might have a different view from the female, but of course I could be wrong about that too. That's by the way. Can it be right to set the views of a random collection of commuters against the application of long and well-established legal principle? Uh, in my view, uh, Justice Michael Kirby of the High Court of Australia was right when he commented that McFarlane was an activist decision. Activist is usually a term of abuse. It's not necessarily in my um, yeah, book, but nevertheless, he was pointing out that they had done something bold in the interests of policy as they saw it. But the saga continued with Parkinson and St. James and Seacroft University Hospital <coughs> NHS Trust. 
the Court of Appeal, permitted the claimant to recover the extra costs of bringing up a disabled child. The reasons given in McFarlane for denying what would on normal legal principles be recoverable were various and elegantly expressed, but all arrived at the same result. At heart, it was a feeling that to compensate for the financial costs of bringing up a healthy child was a step too far. But the notion of a child bringing benefit to the parents is itself deeply suspect, <coughs> smacking of the commodification of the child, regarding the child as an asset to the parents. <coughs> the defendants didn't appeal the Parkinson case. But the saga ends with Rees and the Darlington Memorial Hospital NHS Trust, where the mother was disabled and the child was healthy. The Court of Appeal awarded her the extra costs to her of bringing up the child, which were occasioned by her disability. She was blind. And obviously it was going to cost her a great deal more to bring up the child. This time the defendants did appeal. The House of Lords rejected the mother's attempt to overturn McFarlane altogether. They also rejected my attempt to try and devise a principle from McFarlane, the so-called what I call the deemed equilibrium uh, between the cost and the benefits of a healthy child to healthy parents. They balanced one another out. They preferred to take the fair, just and reasonable route, of course, because you could do what you like, as indeed they did. Uh, three of the seven law lords, Lord Stain, Hope and Hutton, would have held that this too should be an exception to the McFarlane rule, so that the mother should have her extra costs. The majority, however, Lords Bingham, Nichols, Millet and Scott, held that the rule must apply to the birth of a healthy child. The key point was the birth of a healthy child. Um, but they invented a wholly new remedy. An award of a conventional sum, put at £15,000, to recognise the invasion of the mother's right to live her life in the way she had planned. They attributed this recognition of the serious loss of autonomy to Lord Millet in McFarlane. I do dare to hope that my own prolonged account in Parkinson of what having a child means to a woman may have had some effect. <coughs> they didn't give me the credit for it. Uh, but they used it to invent, as I said, a wholly new and unprincipled remedy. Um, this whole saga is a fairly clear example of pragmatism triumphing over legal principle. A more difficult example, principally from the law of contract, is the saga of the Supreme Court's development of the law of illegality. This whole area of law is based on a maxim of public policy, that no court will lend its aid to a man, or indeed a woman, who founds his cause of action on an immoral or illegal act, which can defeat what would otherwise be a good claim in contract, tort, or restitution. Incidentally, uh, I was told to my horror that the Cambridge contract syllabus no longer includes the law of illegality. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that's wrong because it's horrifying. Because um, it's so much a matter which tests all sorts of legal principle, but never mind. Uh, now, this was an area in which, unusually, the Law Commission had spent a long time investigating the illegality defence, and it had declined to recommend legislative reform on the ground that the courts seemed to be developing the law in the right direction. And so they encouraged the courts to go on developing the law for themselves. This was clearly an area of judge-made law, where the judges had got us into a mess, and Parliament was most unlikely to get it out of it. So it was for the judges to try and get it right. And of course, the thorough investigation by the Law Commission was a great help to the courts in doing so. The Law Commission report came before the trilogy of Supreme Court cases, Hunger and Allen, Les Laboratoires Serrier, and Bilter, which had revealed differences of opinion within the Supreme Court itself. One side favoured the reliance rule in Tinsley and Milligan. If you could plead your claim without relying on the illegality, you could recover. If not, not. The other side favoured an integrity of the legal system approach. What was the purpose of the prohibition which had been transgressed? Would it enhance that purpose to deny the claim or not? 
are the countervailing public policies? Would it be proportionate? So those were the two camps. And in Patel and Mirza, a nine-judge panel was assembled to try and resolve matters. <coughs> it's a lovely story. Mr. Patel gave Mr. Mirza £620,000 in order that he could place bets on a bank's share price with the benefit of insider information which Mr. Mirza expected to receive from his contacts. Clearly an illegal transaction. Uh, Mr. Mirza's expectation was not realised, and so the intended betting did not take place. But Mr. Mirza did not return the money to Mr. Patel. He hung on to it. Mr. Patel sued for its return. So did the illegality involved in the enterprise, the insider dealing, bar the claim to get his money back? The Supreme Court unanimously agreed in the result. Mr. Patel should get his money back uh, by application of the law of restitution. But there were differences of approach to the impact of the doctrine of illegality. The majority, Lord Toulson gave the main judgment, um, the others were Lord Newberger, me, Lord Kerr, Lord Wilson and Lord Hodge, upheld the range of factors, integrity of the legal system approach. Whereas the minority, Lord Mance, Lord Clark and Lord Sumption, adopted a rule-based approach, the Tinsley and Milligan approach. The majority held that behind the illegality doctrine were two broad policy reasons. First, that a person should not be allowed to profit from his own wrongdoing. And second, that the law should be coherent and not self-defeating, condoning illegality by giving with the left hand what it takes with the right hand. The long-standing and much criticized rule in Tinsley and Milligan uh, was overruled. The majority emphasised that the court, in taking account of various relevant factors, was not free to decide a case in an undisciplined way. Rather, the public interest is best served by a principled and transparent assessment of the considerations identified. The seriousness of the conduct, its centrality to the contract, whether it was intentional, whether there was a marked disparity in the parties' respective culpability, instead of the more formal approach advocated by the minority. This is because the formal approach was capable of producing results which may appear arbitrary, unjust, or disproportionate. The minority, on the other hand, felt that the mix of factors approach would not offer the same coherence or certainty and, quote, converts a legal principle into an exercise of discretion in the process, exhibiting all the vices of complexity, uncertainty, arbitrariness, and lack of transparency, which Lord Toulson had attributed to the present law. You spin a coin, don't you? I don't think it's a coincidence that it was the three uh, commercial lawyers who formed that view, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, uh, in their view, the proper response of the Supreme Court was to supply a framework of principle which accommodates legitimate concerns about the present law. We will be doing no service to the coherent development of the law if we sub simply substituted a new mess for the old one. Now, was it the majority or the minority who are being pragmatic here. The goal of justice or of certainty could both be said to be pragmatic aims. The first recognising the impossibility of creating a satisfactory rule without regard to the circumstances and the impact of the illegality. The second, recognising the need for litigants <coughs> to be able to predict the outcome of the claim. Now, one answer could be for the statute laying down the particular requirements in the transaction of particular types of business to specify what the civil consequences of failure to comply with those requirements will be. That's the obvious answer, but of course they don't always do so. But even if they are prepared to do it, it may well do so in terms which leave a discretion to the courts. Thus, in our recent decision in a case called Wells and Devani, an estate agent who orally agreed to try and find buyers for the flats which the owner urgently needed to sell did not supply the vendor with his written terms of business, including his commission rate and the occasion on which it would become payable until after the buyer had been introduced. This is contrary to the requirements of Section 18 of the Estate Agents Act 1979 and accompanying regulations. Section 18, subsection 5 provides that failure to comply 
renders the contract unenforceable unless the court orders otherwise. But if the agent applies to the court to enforce the contract, section 18, subsection 6, provides that the court may only dismiss the application if it considers this just, having regard to the prejudice caused to the client and the culpability of the agent. Where the court does not dismiss the application, it may order that the sum payable be reduced to compensate the client for the prejudice caused. The trial judge reduced the agent's commission by one third. This looks very like the majority approach in Patel and Mirza, doesn't it? Uh, but with the added ingredient of the power to make a deduction. Now, could the common law be flexible enough to include a power to make a deduction? Well, some of the things they get up to, you never know. Um, but, um, it's, it's an example of the intractability of that particular problem. My third example, one very dear to my heart, is marital agreements. Now, the common law recognises that there is a public interest in ensuring that married couples fulfil their financial obligations to one another so that the burden is not thrown upon the state. The common law also used to recognise that married couples had an enforceable duty to live together, although that duty was more easily enforced by the husband than by the wife. But the spouses might agree to relieve one another of that duty and might also agree the financial terms of doing so. Once the validity of separation agreements was recognised, the common law drew a distinction between agreements between couples who were already separated or were about to separate and agreements for a possible future separation between them. Separation agreements were generally regarded as a good thing. They mitigated the harmful effects of separation upon the dependent spouse and any children. They might well make better or more flexible provision than a court had power to make. Hence, they were enforceable by the parties, although if there were matrimonial proceedings, they could not oust the jurisdiction of the court to order that proper provision be made. And following recommendations made by a royal commission in the 1950s, a statutory power to vary their terms was introduced to cater for changes in circumstances since the agreement was made. Pre-separation agreements, on the other hand, whether made before or after the marriage, were generally regarded as a bad thing and thus contrary to public policy. They were catering in advance for a possible breach of the obligation to live together. They might even encourage the couple to separate. Now that policy was applied both to pre-separation agreements made during the marriage and pre-marriage agreements catering for the possibility of separation or divorce should the couple marry. And the rest of the common law world adopted the same approach. Then came the case of MacLeod and MacLeod on appeal from the Isle of Man to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. This concerned a post-nuptial agreement which had been made while the couple were still living together and when they separated was put into effect. Then they divorced and the wife was claiming what she regarded as full financial provision on top of what she'd got from that agreement. The husband mounted a full-scale attack upon the common law's approach to pre-separation agreements. Now, the board, the Judicial Committee, took the view that it was not open to them to reverse the long-standing rule that anti-nuptial agreements were contrary to public policy. We said... There is an enormous difference in principle and in practice between an agreement providing for a present state of affairs, which has developed between a married couple, and an agreement made before the parties have committed themselves to the rights and responsibilities of the married state, purporting to govern what might happen in an uncertain and unhoped for future. On the other hand, postnuptial agreements are very different from prenuptial agreements. The couple are now married. They have undertaken towards one another the obligations and responsibilities of the married state. A prenuptial agreement is no longer the price which one party may extract for his or her willingness to marry. We went on to say there was nothing to stop couples entering into binding contractual arrangements governing their life together, provided, of course, that they manifest an intent to create legal relations 
But this couple had done that by making a deed um, or an agreement to govern their life apart when they separated. So why should they not be able to bind themselves in advance of their separation? Couples no longer had an enforceable duty to live together, so the old policy against encouraging their separation no longer held good. And the statutory power to vary agreements, if there was a change of circumstance, applied to any agreement made between a married couple, whether before or after their separation. So the board held that the agreement was valid and enforceable, except that it couldn't oust the jurisdiction of a court. But the court should give it the same weight that it would give to a separation agreement, which would normally be respected in the absence of unfairness in the circumstances in which it was made or a subsequent change in circumstances. Now, was that development pragmatic or principled? Well, whichever it was. I thought it was quite principled at the time, but I was very soon hoist with my own petard. <coughs> Sorry, the board's judgment was delivered by me, of course, but um, in a case called Radmacher and Granatino. There, the majority of the Supreme Court wholeheartedly agreed that the old rule, that agreements providing for a future separation, a contrary to public policy, was obsolete and should be swept away for the very reasons that we gave. However, they wouldn't restrict it to post-nuptial agreements. They disagreed with both of the reasons which we had given for drawing the distinction. First, and most alarmingly, they disagreed about the power of variation. Now, if they had held that the power also applied to anti-nuptial agreements, which is a tenable view, then I would see that it could go a long way towards mitigating the problem. But instead, they doubted whether the power of variation applied to any pre-separation agreement, which of course makes matters a great deal worse. Second, they didn't agree that there was always a difference between anti- and post-nuptial agreements. Well, I think I would agree that there isn't always a difference, but I strongly disagreed. Um, the case seemed to me to raise policy issues which could not and should not be resolved by a court deciding a particular case, especially a case which had such unusual facts. And I said, this is a complicated subject upon which there is a large literature and knowledgeable and thoughtful people may legitimately hold different views. Some may regard freedom of contract as the prevailing principle in all circumstances. Others may regard that as a 19th century concept which has since been severely modified, particularly in the case of continuing relationships, typically, though not invariably, characterised by imbalance of bargaining power, such as landlord and tenant, employer and employee. Some may regard people who are about to marry as in all respects fully autonomous beings. Others may wonder whether people who are typically, although not invariably in love, can be expected to make rational choices in the same way that businessmen can. You're not expected to make rational choices about love, are you? Sorry, that's not, yeah. There we go. Otherwise, none of us would ever get married or have a relationship. <laughs> Some may regard the recognition of these factual differences as patronizing or paternalistic. Others may regard them as sensible and realistic. Some may think that to accord a greater legal status to these agreements will produce greater certainty and lesser cost should the couple divorce. Others may question whether this will in fact be achieved, save at the price of inflexibility and injustice. Some may believe that giving greater force to marital agreements will encourage more people to marry. Others may wonder whether they will encourage more people to divorce. Perhaps above all, some may think it permissible to contract out of the guiding principles of equality and non-discrimination within marriage. Others may think this is a retrograde step likely only to benefit the strong at the expense of the weak. Well, in 1834, Burrow J pronounced against arguing too strongly on public policy because, quote, it is a very unruly horse, and once you get astride it, you never know where it will carry you, end quote. Well, if ever there was an unruly horse, it was Radmacher and Granatino. Uh, but which side was being principled and which pragmatic. In fact, we were both being pragmatic as we saw it. And a very fine illustration it is of the dangers involved. After all, in neither MacLeod nor Radmacher did we need to decide 
whether or not the agreements were enforceable as contracts. Both cases were about the weight to be given them by the court deciding what orders to make in divorce proceedings. In McLeod, we could have decided that a post-marital pre-separation should usually be given the same weight as a separation agreement without undoing the old public policy rule. What the majority in Radmacher would then have decided, I cannot say. Uh, but they would perhaps have been less likely to change the law on enforceability. Pragmatism is as unruly a horse as public uh, policy. Indeed, I am not sure what the difference is. The dangers are obvious. Now, it may be that I am suffering from cognitive dissonance in this context, as well as in the constitutional context where I've been accused of it. I'll, co I'll come back and talk about cognitive dissonance in the autumn, I think. Yeah. Yep. Um, but uh, I think that my caution stems from having had the experience both of law reform at the Law Commission and deciding the hard cases in the Supreme Court. Generally speaking, the incremental approach from established principle is to be preferred to imposing the court's own choices, which are clearly based on practical or policy considerations rather than on principle. Although I took a different view from the majority in the case of Michael and the Chief Constable of South Wales, I welcome the fact that the majority decided against a police duty of care towards a person whose life they knew to be at risk, not on the basis of policy reasons which had largely been exploded, but on the basis of principle. Generally, there is no liability for omissions and no duty to protect from the unlawful acts of third parties. The McFarland saga is a very good example going the other way. The lower courts in England and Scotland had reached a result by applying conventional principles. If Parliament or the public didn't like it, then Parliament could have changed it. Instead, in Rees, the majority had to resort to an extraordinary device to row back from the unjust results of the earlier policy-based decision. I would also say that the mcleod radmacher saga is a good example. The practical and policy arguments were even more complicated. And there are aspects to the problem which are much more susceptible to legislative solutions than to judicial pronouncement in individual cases. What prior safeguards should be required? What variation powers should there be? What exceptions, if any, should be made to cater for need? What, if any, power should the court have to depart from the agreed arrangements on divorce and so on? Loads of policy questions. Better for the solution of by Parliament. But what about illegality? That's the really hard case. Experience had shown that a one-size-fits-all approach simply wouldn't work, given the wide variety of situations in which the question can arise. Experience had also shown that attempts to devise a single legislative solution also wouldn't work. Legislative solutions are best tailored to the particular legislative scheme establishing the illegality, as the Estate Agents Act showed. And they might very well entail the same sort of flexible flexibility as in Patel and Merza. So I'm not sure whether I was being consistent in joining the majority in the illegality case, having been resistant to it in Radmacher and um, in, of course, the McFarlane saga. So I offer a final <laughs> word from Lord Kerr, dissenting in Michael. He said... A decision based on what is considered to be correct legal principle cannot likely be set aside in subsequent cases where the same legal principle is in play. By contrast, a decision which is not the product of, in the words of Lord Oliver, any logical process of analogical deduction <coughs> holds less sway, particularly if it doesn't accord with what the subsequent decision maker considers to be the correct instinctive reaction to contemporaneous standards and conditions. Put bluntly, what one group of judges felt was the correct policy answer in 2009 should not bind another group of judges even as little as five years later. You have been warned. <laughs> Thank you. Lady Hale, uh, Vice-Chancellor, members of the judiciary, the faculty and the student body and others here uh, present. I, I have been entrusted with a suitably simple and straightforward, undemanding task 
uh, but one that is no less important or, or pleasurable for that. It is to offer my sincere thanks to Lady Hale on behalf of Freshfields, uh, members of this very fortunate audience uh, present and future viewers of the lecture once Dan Bates has worked his magic and the uh, lecture will be available to view on the faculty website. I do wonder if uh, Lady Hale might one day tire of being not only a DBE, Dane Commander of the British Empire, a PC, Privy Councillor, but also the FWH, the first woman who. We've heard uh, examples from Sarah, Law Commission, House of Lords, Supreme Court Justice, President of the Supreme Court, uh, and now to cap it all, the first woman to deliver this lecture. Uh, and in the year in which we celebrate 100 years of women being admitted to the legal profession in the United Kingdom and on the eve of International Women's Day 2019. It is wonderfully appropriate. It could almost have been planned that way. <laughs> Charles Dickens had something to say about principle and the law as he bemoaned the fate of the unfortunate litigants in John Dice and John Dice in Bleak House. Uh, one of the one great principle of the English law, he observed, is to make business for itself at the expense of the laity. There is no other principle so distinctly, certainly, and consistently maintained throughout all its narrow turnings. Um, we are immensely grateful to Lady Hell for sharing with us a more reassuring uh, description of the role that principle plays in, in the legal profession and the influence of law, twinned with the influence of pragmatism that you've uh, so carefully and eloquently explained. Um, the study of law as an undergraduate, uh, at least in my fading memory, also required some balancing of those two concepts. There are only so many principles it was possible to commit to memory, what with any, everything else going on uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, yet it was possible to deploy those principles, uh, the, or the few of them that stuck in the memory liberally, in answer to pretty much any question, um, <laughs> whether to do with tort, contract, family law, or anything else. Um, uh, but bearing in mind the anniversary uh, I've mentioned, it's surely fitting to pay tribute to Lady Hale, who has been an uncompromising champion of diversity in all its forms, a trailblazer and a role model for so many, herself combining principle and pragmatism in her approach to promoting gender balance, ethnicity, uh, and social uh, mobility in the law, up to and including the composition of our highest uh, domestic court. She's been a clear-eyed proponent of equality of opportunity, but an opponent of positive discrimination. Interviewed for the Guardian newspaper at the beginning of this year, Lady Hale expressed the hope that the judiciary would attract more people who have had less, less privileged lives, whilst at the same time noting that it's possible to have a privileged life without coming from a privileged background. That sentiment surely chimes with Cambridge's outreach ambitions and activities which are shared by those of the law firm that I represent and many others in hoping to attract the best talent into the legal profession. But whatever our respective backgrounds, we have indeed been privileged to be part of this audience and to hear the views of someone at the very top of that profession to deliver such a wonderful exposition of the subject. Please join me in thanking Lady Hale for delivering this year's lecture.